Hello, Lindsay Sturton here. In this video, I'm going to talk about statements of compatibility under the Human Rights Act. We will be looking at what a statement of compatibility is, and we will look at an example of when statements of compatibility have been made, and an example of where a statement of compatibility was conspicuously not made. By the time you have watched this video, you will understand something about the legal and political effects of such statements. Before I get into details, I think it is important to distinguish a statement of compatibility from a declaration of incompatibility, because although the two expressions sound similar, they refer to quite different things. So, to be clear, a statement of compatibility is an aspect of parliamentary procedure, a statement made by the executive when a government bill is introduced to parliament, whereas a declaration of incompatibility is a judicial order which might be made after a provision in primary legislation is successfully challenged, typically in judicial review proceedings. I will make reference to declarations of incompatibility later in the video, so pay attention and please don't confuse the two. Okay, with that out of the way, let's take a look at an example of a statement of compatibility. The Nationality and Borders Bill has been in the news recently. It is a controversial piece of legislation and concerns about the bill from a human rights perspective have been raised for example, from the Joint Committee on Human Rights, which, as you probably know, is a committee of both Houses of Parliament. So the bill is a nice illustration of some of the issues in relation to statements of compatibility. I won't be concerned with the ins and outs of this controversy, but it does make it a good vehicle for discussion of statements of compatibility. Now, if you take a look at the bill as introduced to Parliament, I've placed a link in the description below. You will see that on the very first page that it says, Secretary Priti Patel has made the following statement under section 19.1a of the Human Rights Act 1998. In my view, the provisions of the Nationality and Borders Bill are compatible with the Convention rights. So that is an example of a statement of compatibility. Now, as you may have guessed from the words under section 19.1a of the Human Rights Act, this statement was not included in the bill because Priti Patel was moved personally to share her views about the human rights implications of the legislation. To see why it was made, let's take a look at section 19 of the Human Rights Act 1998. It tells us that a Minister of the Crown in charge of a bill in either House of Parliament must, before the second reading of the bill, a. make a statement to the effect that, in his view, the provisions of the bill are compatible with the Convention rights, a statement of compatibility, it's called, or make, an, make a statement to the effect that, although he is unable to make a statement of compatibility, the government nevertheless wishes the House to proceed with the bill. And throughout the rest of this video, I'll talk about an alternative statement to refer to a statement under Section 19.1b. And for completeness, Section 19 also tells us that the statement must be in writing and be published in such manner as the Minister making it considers appropriate. So let us now consider the purpose of this section, as presented in the white paper, Rights Brought Home. This was a document produced by the Labour government in 1997, setting out the government's thinking around what would become the Human Rights Act. As the white paper put it, the purpose of the requirement was to make the human rights implication of proposed government legislation more transparent. In other words, it is not to prevent Parliament legislating contrary to Convention rights, or even to prevent the Executive from proposing such legislation, but it is to make it absolutely clear if and when a government were to introduce incompatible legislation. 
As the White Paper put it, there may be occasions where such a statement cannot be provided. For example, because it is essential to legislate on a particular issue, but the policy in question requires a risk to be taken in relation to the Convention or because the arguments in relation to the convention issues raised are not clear-cut. In such cases, the minister will indicate that he or she cannot provide a positive statement, but that the government nevertheless wishes Parliament to proceed to consider the bill. Parliament would expect the minister to explain his or her reasons during the normal course of the proceedings on the bill. This will ensure that the human rights implications are debated at the earliest opportunity. As the White Paper put it, the intention behind Section 191b, as an alternative to a ministerial statement of compatibility, was to ensure that all ministers, their departments and officials are fully seized of the gravity of the Convention's obligations in respect of human rights. In other words, as part of its overall objective of creating a culture of rights, the Human Rights Act is not trying to prevent ministers or parliament from doing anything that they are firmly resolved to do, but it creates a framework in which the human rights implications of legislation are carefully considered. That is why Section 191b allows ministers to issue an alternative form of words when they wish to proceed with legislation, even though it may be problematic in terms of the human rights implications. Again, this is not necessarily because the Human Rights Act anticipates that a future government may be wicked enough to intentionally violate the human rights of individuals. But as the White Paper says, a government may wish to take a risk that a provision in legislation might exceed the margin of appreciation traditionally given to states' own understanding of the human rights context, or otherwise fall afoul of an interpretation of the Convention given by the European Court of Human Rights. I am aware of only one occasion in which an alternative Section 191b statement was made. In other words, in which a minister stated that she wished to proceed with legislation despite being unable to make a statement of compatibility and it illustrates the previous point very nicely. The bill in question became the Communications Act 2003, still the framework legislation for communications regulation in the UK. The clause that became Section 319 2G of that Act imposed a ban on political advertising on TV and radio. This was a considered position and many would no doubt say a responsible one in relation to political speech, although no doubt others would disagree. But a decision of the European Court of Human Rights, Tierfabriken and Switzerland, had held that a refusal to broadcast an advert on grounds of its political content was prima facie a restriction of freedom of expression under Article 10 of the Convention, and as such required justification. Now, the Culture Secretary, who at the time was Tessa Jowell, mindful of this recent European Court of Human Rights decision, felt, or more likely was given legal advice, that given the risk that Section 319 of the Communications Act might fall foul of Tierfabrikan, instead made the alternative statement under Section 191b, that although she was unable to make a statement of compatibility, the government nevertheless wished the House to proceed with the bill. This did not mean that the government necessarily believed that the clause was incompatible with convention rights, just that it was not able to give an assurance implied by a statement of compatibility. I think the example of the ban on political advertising in the Communications Act is instructive because it shows how a failure to make a Section 191A statement of compatibility can have both political and perhaps also, indirectly at least, legal effects. So let's examine each of these in turn. 
The main political effect of the alternative statement can be seen in terms of the close scrutiny given to the communication bill's ban on political advertising as it made its way through Parliament. The advertising ban was the subject of two separate reports of the Joint Committee on Human Rights and a specially convened committee of both houses also looked into the issue and whether, for example, the goals of legislation could be achieved in a less restrictive way. This was much more intense scrutiny than would normally expect in a regulatory reform statute. What this shows, I think, is that the Human Rights Act was operating exactly as it was intended to act, not as a lawyer's charter, as some contend, but as a framework in which the various institutions of the state, legislative, executive and judicial, all have a role to play in building a culture of respect for human rights. The government was scrupulous in ensuring a potential human rights issue was highlighted to Parliament. And Parliament, for its part, took the time and care to examine the human rights implications of the bill and decided that it was comfortable with where the bill drew the line between freedom of expression and, and other values such as preserving the quality and integrity of political information. Now it so happens that the Communications Act was challenged in court and I'll turn to that in a few moments. But let's first consider the general issue of what is the legal effect of our Section 19.1a Statement of Compatibility. Let's, by way of example, return for a moment to the Nationality and Borders Bill currently before Parliament. Could someone who disagreed with the Home Secretary Priti Patel's assessment that the bill was compatible with convention rights seek a judicial review of the ministerial statement? Or could a piece of legislation be challenged in court if a statement of compatibility were made insincerely or in bad faith? If a minister in future was less scrupulous than Culture Secretary Tessa Jowell was in 2003? The short answer to both of these questions is no. And you should in principle not be surprised by this if you have watched my previous videos on parliamentary privilege and on the legislative supremacy of Parliament. You may recall from my parliamentary privilege video that Article 9 of the Bill of Rights says that the freedom of speech and debates or proceedings in Parliament ought not to be impeached or questioned in any court or place out of Parliament. A statement of compatibility is a statement by the executive to Parliament and as such can only be impeached or questioned in Parliament. So political consequences may follow, and we might speculate whether, in extreme cases, a minister might be held in contempt of Parliament, but the courts have no power to make orders in respect of a Section 19 statement. What about a challenge to legislation itself? Could a statement of compatibility made in bad faith ground a challenge to the legislation if it was subsequently passed? Again, I think the answer is no. If you have studied the legislative supremacy of Parliament, you should be familiar with the case of British Railways Board and Pickin. That case was concerned with a challenge to the British Railways Act 1968, a private act of Parliament which Pickin alleged was only passed because British Railways had misled Parliament. But the House of Lords, acting in its appellate legal capacity, was not prepared to look into such allegations, because doing so, it said, would involve an inquiry into how Parliament and its officers had performed their functions. This was not something the House of Lords were prepared to do. As Lord Reid said in that case, for a century or more, both Parliament and the courts have been careful not to act so as to cause conflict between them. Any such investigations as the respondent seeks could easily lead to such a conflict, and I would only support it if I were compelled to do so by clear authority. But it appears to me that the whole trend of authority over a century is clearly against permitting any such investigation. 
So I think that based on Pickin, you can safely say that an act of parliament couldn't be challenged on the ground of an erroneous or fraudulent ministerial statement of compatibility, because to do so would also be to impeach the way in which parliament had done its job in scrutinising a ministerial statement. And that would, as Lord Reed says, invite conflict between the courts and Parliament. So, no, you couldn't argue before a court that a fraudulent statement of compatibility had induced Parliament to pass legislation, but otherwise it would not have done. But there may be some more subtle legal effects of a statement of compatibility or the alternative statement because the courts have, under Section 4 of the Human Rights Act, the power to make a declaration of incompatibility, a judicial declaration that primary legislation is incompatible with human rights. You might ask, if a minister were to issue an alternative Section 191b statement, would that mean that the court would likely take the same view? After all, if a minister isn't prepared to stand by the compatibility of a bill with convention rights, Why should a court not issue a declaration of incompatibility if a challenge was brought? At this point, let's pick up the story of the Communication Act 2003. As the explanatory notes of the Communications Bill stated, the fact that the Minister made a statement under Section 191b of that Act does not, however, mean that the government believes the ban would necessarily be found to be incompatible if the ban were to be challenged in the United Kingdom courts or to be considered by the European Court of Human Rights. Now, that is just about what you might expect, given what we have said about the government being prepared to take a risk in relation to the effects of the tier fabrican decision. And in fact, and I'm going out on a bit of a limb here, you might even say that the use of the alternative statement under Section 19 had the opposite effect of shoring up the legislation and making it more likely to survive judicial review. In other words, an alternative statement under Section 191b might even discourage a court from issuing a declaration of incompatibility. This is illustrated by what happened next in the story of the Communications Act. Section 319 of the Communications Act was the subject of a legal challenge in a case called Animal Defenders International. Animal Defenders International was a group who wanted to run a TV advertising campaign in favour of animal rights, something which would have been prevented by Section 319. And in his speech in the House of Lords, Lord Bingham discussed the question of how much weight should be given to the judgment of Parliament in deciding to proceed with the legislation. In other words, should the courts be mindful of the care which Parliament had taken in considering whether to issue a, in considering the legislation and making its decision about whether to issue a Section 4 declaration of incompatibility? This, said Lord Bingham, depended on the context of the subject matter. But on the facts of the case before him, he thought the judgment of Parliament should be accorded very great weight. In other words, the fact that Parliament had considered the Section 19 statement and had decided to pass the legislation anyway was a good reason for thinking that the legislation was compatible with human rights. Lord Bingham offered three reasons in support of this conclusion. In the first place, he said, democratically elected politicians could be expected to be peculiarly sensitive and certainly more sensitive than judges as to the measures required to ensure the integrity of democracy. Second, Parliament had been fully aware of the possible incompatibility with Article 10 properly recognising the interpretative supremacy of the European Court of Human Rights on the issue. The judgment of Parliament on such an issue, he said, should not be lightly overridden. Finally, legislation has to be framed to address generalities. As Lord Bingham explained, a general rule means that a line must be drawn and it is for Parliament to decide where. 
The drawing of a line inevitably means that hard cases will arise falling on the wrong side of it. But that should not be held to invalidate the rule if judged in the round it is beneficial. If that seems unnecessarily detailed for the purpose of understanding the possible legal effects of a section 191b statement, then the important point to remember is this. In certain circumstances, a court may well be mindful of the latitude properly afforded to Parliament in deciding how best to protect human rights while pursuing particular policy goals, as well as the care with which Parliament has decided to exercise this judgment. In order to say, well, in order for the court to say, no, even though there is a judgment to be made about whether a particular enactment is contrary to a convention right, we will defer to Parliament's judgment on this particular matter. So paradoxically, where a minister is unable to make a statement of compatibility and makes the alternative statement under section 191b, this might encourage the courts to exercise restraint in ruling a particular provision to be incompatible with convention rights. So, after all that, by way of review, you should now be familiar with the device of a statement of compatibility under section 19 of the Human Rights Act. You have seen an example of a bill in respect of which a statement of compatibility was issued, and one in respect of which the alternative statement was made. So you should be familiar with the form of words which section 19.1a requires, as well as the alternative form of words under section 19.1b. And you should understand something of the political as well as the possible legal effects of a statement of compatibility and of the alternative statement. I have been sceptical that a ministerial statement could be challenged, still less a challenge could be made to legislation based on an erroneous or misleading ministerial statement. But we have pointed to possible indirect legal effects as seen in the Animal Defenders case. So if you have made it this far, I hope you have found the discussion useful. If you have any questions or if you just want to let me know how you found this video or if there's any other videos you'd like me to make, do leave a comment below. I'll see you hopefully in another video. For now, goodbye.